Good evening, everyone. This is Shane Gebauer, the General Manager of Brushy Mountain Bee Farm. Thanks for tuning in. And tonight we've got ourselves a special guest. We've got Kim Fodham, editor of Bee Culture Magazine. Kim is probably one of the most sought-after speakers in our industry, uh, has his finger on the pulse in all aspects from the small-scale backyard beekeeper on up into the big commercial uh, beekeepers, the package producers, uh, and, and all facets in between. So it's a real pleasure to have him here with us this evening. He's been doing this a long time and knows his stuff, and so I think we're in for a great talk. Kim, thanks for joining us. You're welcome, Shane. It's good to be back. It's good to have you back. We enjoy it every time. <laughs> There's always a good turnout for you, and uh, we look forward to hearing about the 10 rules for modern beekeeping. Okay, are we ready? We're ready. Take her away. Okay, all right. Well, good evening, folks. It's nice to be here again. Uh, the, the 10 rules for modern beekeeping, and of course, these are only 10. I didn't intentionally didn't put the 10 rules for modern beekeeping because there are more. And, and as beekeeping evolves and as you evolve as a beekeeper, you're going to find things that fit in here that, that uh, you think should be added. But these are 10 of the things, and I'll tell you where they came from. I've sort of adapted um, basic animal husbandry um, uh, concepts and applied them to bees in a box. And, and, and if you take a step back and you take a look and you can say, okay, I've got cats and dogs and goats and, and chickens and whatever, and, and the concept of each of these pretty much fits almost any kind of animal, any, any kind of livestock that you're going to deal with. Uh, some people say it fits your children, too, so you may want to take a look at that. I'm not sure. But anyway, these are 10 rules for modern beekeeping, and I guess we'll get started. Uh, anybody knows anybody that's um, um, been in bees for more than about four minutes knows that you've got to have good queens. And the, the basis behind good queens, in my opinion, uh, the, first, the first and foremost, foremost is they have to have been raised in luxury. And that includes all of the things that the queen producers do. They have to have, they have, to have right off the bat, they have to have a, a clean home. Uh, I'm going <clears> to, <throat> excuse me, I'm going to mention this more than once. The wax that we have in our beehives, if it's been in there more than two years, it's too old. And it's harboring way too much junk. The, the, the things that beekeepers put in is just as bad as the, the stuff that the bees are picking up on in the field and bringing home. And even if you're not putting anything in your hive yourself, the foundation that you're, that you're buying is going to have some issues. So take a look at recycling your wax. I'm saying every two years. I've been doing mine every two years and some of it every every year and I've seen a difference over the last three or four years where things that are hard to measure and I'm not a scientist but uh, when bees are raised in luxury one of the things that they're raised in is good clean new wax. So that's one of the part, parts of it but it also has a lot to do with the food. That they, enough food, enough workers, enough good care, enough good beekeepers, everything that, that um, goes into taking care of a queen so to make sure that everything that she needs, could possibly need, might even think of needing, is handled before she even has a need for it. So queens should be raised in luxury. They should be extremely well mated. That goes without saying, but I'm going to say it anyway because too often it doesn't work. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, if you're getting your queens from a queen producer, uh, you might want to ask some questions about how many drone yards they've got set up, and are their drone are their drone yards uh, how do they how do they handle the mite problem in drone yards? You know, mites like drones, and and if you've got mites in your in your uh, drone colonies, you're going to have some physically challenged uh, and health challenged drones, and they don't fly as fast, fly as, fly as far. You know, there's just some issues, and, and uh, you, you certainly want to, and are there enough of them? And are there enough of them at the right time? And was the weather good when your queen was mated? You know, the way things are anymore, uh, uh, in terms of being able to spot the weather, you know where your queen producer is. You can watch the weather where, where they are every day right now on your, you know, on your smartphone. 
or on your computer. And if you if you've been watching the weather and it's been raining for eight or nine days, wherever it is this queen producer is, you might want to ask some questions when you say you got any queens. And he says, Yeah, I just got some. Uh, you know, we we just uh, produce them, and wow, it's been raining for nine days. How well were they mated? So. It, it, it behooves you to pay attention to what's going on wherever it is your queen producer is to make sure that they aren't trapped inside for four or five days, that there's enough drones and that the drones are living in a clean nest. And, and, and uh, watching those details is going to make sure that you get the best queen that you can and hopefully that the queen producer is watching them too. Healthy beyond belief, without a doubt, the, most, uh, 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 the other most important thing, they're all important, of course, but making sure that the queen that you get when you get her isn't, isn't damaged, uh, has been living in a clean home, hasn't been su subject to any of the diseases, hasn't been, hasn't been drugged to death in terms of mite control and nosema and all of those things, but at the same time has been taken care of so that she is healthy when you get her, so that when she hits, gets in your colony, she hits the road running. One of the things that one of the things that we are seeing now and people are beginning to pay attention to is how long should that queen stay in that queen cage when you're putting her in an established colony? And the old saw what well, used to be, well you put her in there when you put her in when you put in your package, you leave her in there for three days and then you come back and if she isn't already released, you release her. And that the the what's going on with queens anymore and what's going on with with bees and the things that bees are subject to, that three days is being pushed out farther and farther. And if I said seven to ten days, I'm not I'm not kidding anymore. It's a long time to go uh, to leave her in there, and you need to check and make sure she's doing okay. But it just it seems that bee, it's taken bees longer to get used to new queens and queens getting used to uh, being uh, put in a different colony. And it's kind of good insurance, I think, um, but you got to keep your eye on them. But don't assume that that three days is the best there is. You might want to push it back a little bit. An egg-laying machine. How many eggs a day does a queen lay, and how do you know? And, and if you're not producing between 1,600 and 2,000 eggs after she's been out of that cage for two weeks, then maybe you need to be looking at her. How do you tell how many eggs she's laying? Here's how you tell. You got a picture of a you got a picture of a brood frame up there, and and you got a phone on your you got a, a, a camera on your cell phone. Take the picture of that. Take a picture of all the sealed brood when you go to your colony tomorrow. And and uh, go home and count them. Now you can take a look at that and you can say, okay, a deep frame is is 50 cells high and 90 90 cells wide about, or you can count them and figure out, and you've got You've got about 4,500 cells on the side of a deep frame. And after doing this three, four times, you're going to get pretty good at estimating how many cells there. That's sealed brood. Now what you do is you come back in 12 days and you do it again. And the difference is how many eggs a day that queen is laying because it takes 12 days to go from egg to sealed brood. So you can estimate pretty accurately the amount of sealed brood that a queen is raising or the amount of eggs that a queen is laying. It should be increasing and hit a plateau in the summer, begin to decrease in the fall, shut maybe shut right down to nothing or to very few later in the fall. You should be able to see that pattern get established and watch your queen and see that she's producing good and that uh, she's doing what you want her to do. And if she's not, it, allows, it gives you the information to make a good decision. So good queens, rule number one. Good genetics. I've got up here one of the things is adapted to your location, and that's, of course, local queens. And, and there's some back and forth going on right now as, as a queen local, if she's, if, if, you know, she's, how adapted does she need to be to your location so that she does well? And, that, that that's kind of a hard measure. Um, <coughs> excuse me. It's kind of a hard thing to measure because uh, one of the arguments I heard just recently is if you have to feed a colony, that colony is not adapted to your location, and there's some truth to that. But but again, you got to look at your location may have changed this year from last year. There may be a lot more corn this year than last year, or a lot less corn and more soybeans, whatever it is. So. Uh, I guess what I'm saying, adapted to your location, I'm looking at queens that um, are, are mating with drones that have come from queens that have been living in my area as long as possible. 
we've got a queen producer here in Medina County that's been doing this five or six years, and she's never, they've, her bees have never been out of Medina County, and her queens haven't either, and they're doing just fine. And are they adapted to Medina County? They seem to be. They seem to be okay uh, in my bee yard. But local queens, if you can get them, suitable to your management. Here's a, here's a thought. Um, one of the things about, about uh, Russian bees that I like, Russian bees are slow to wake up in the spring. They're just real conservative until the weather is just perfect, and they're pretty sure it's going to be perfect for the rest of the season. So they're slow to start. They're really good at using available resources. Also, when you have a, a drought in the summer or a dearth sometime, anytime during the year. But Russian bees in the, in the spring are slow to start. Well, so am I. I'm on the road way too much in the spring, and, and by the time I get home and get some time, most of my bees would have swarmed because they would have built up and they would have gone, and I, I'm not there to, to do the things that need to be done, and, and the Russian bees are just beginning to wake up. So it's suitable to your management. If you're a go-getter and you're out there in February and you're wanting to be doing bees and you've got things going and your bees are waking up in February and they're beginning to raise brood and look for food, that's the kind of bee you need. If you got one a little bit slower, you know, you want one doesn't wake up quite so soon, and, and like you, and then when you're ready, they're ready, and you can go. So uh, suitable to your management style. Take a look at, at the genetics that uh, your queens are going to have. Resistant to common problems. You know, that goes, that, that, that I was going to say it again, that goes without saying, but it does. You need to, the more, the 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 better your bees are able to handle the common diseases we have, and I'm talking the fowl broods and chalk brood and 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 all and the like, not not mites so much, but mites also. The better off they're going to be, the less you have to worry about, the less time and uh, energy and resources you have to put into that colony. Uh, we're going to talk more about mites in a minute. Efficient producers uh, build on, you know, don't build on the flow. Have them build, you know, before the flow, so they have a good. Uh, population when you have your main honey flow and 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 then they've got a good field force because your queen is laying eggs enough eggs at the right time so that you've got enough bees it takes a lot of bees to make a lot of honey is exactly true and you have to have a lot of bees ready at the right time and well behaved especially if you've got people around uh, you don't want bees that are just being you know being being a problem all the time you want them to be able and it's more fun keeping bees when you when you can go out there on a hot, hot day and have to only wear a t-shirt instead of a full bee suit, that sort of thing. That little note on the <clears throat> on the bottom down there is, is um, well worth remembering. Uh, an average queen in a great colony is going to outperform a great queen in a poor colony every time. And, and you can have the most expensive, best queen in the world, and if you put her in a colony that isn't worth its salt, she isn't going to do it. She isn't going to do any better. She isn't going to, she isn't going to, get the opportunity to really shine. So she, if you get a good queen, you need to provide her a good home, and that responsibility lies with you. So number three, pest management. Uh, at the top of the list, Varroa. No one deal with Varroa and its viruses. I've been talking to a lot of commercial people in the last year, and, and the message I'm getting loud and clear from all of these people who are doing well who aren't losing colonies and who aren't who aren't re you know replacing bees all of the time that are that they go into that that uh, start the summer with a with a number of colonies and end up with more instead of fewer, and what they're telling me across the board is that we're looking at instead of the five or ten or fifteen percent uh, infestation rate for varroa, we're looking at one percent. The minute it goes above one percent, we do something. And or we're doing something all the time so that it never gets up to one percent. Either way, if you're looking at and this is you know the sugar shake or the the uh, alcohol, however you're monitoring your mites, 300 in a jar, put in sugar. How many mites you got? Let's figure out the percent. The minute it, the minute you've got more than three mites, you got a problem. So so. You should be doing something earlier to keep the population down, drone trapping, uh, making summer splits, whatever it is that you're doing that's good IPM. Um, then then that should, hopefully that will keep it down. If it doesn't keep it down, then you're monitoring, 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 monitoring. 
uh, all the time you're putting in and looking to see what the infestation rate is and doing something when it gets to be or before it gets to be too much. So if it gets to be t to the point where you're going to have to treat and you're looking at, at uh, doing something, the soft chemicals, if you're using any chemicals at all, you start with the essential oils, several of them on the market, they all work pretty well. Uh, the, the organic acids all work pretty well, don't do anything to your wax. Uh, these are the things that you want to look at to keep your population down at 1%. And the hard stuff just never, kumufos and fluvalinate um, and, and the other ones uh, walk away because, because that's what's junking up your wax. If you can avoid them, if you're ex exchanging wax every year, then a hard chemical might be a good choice to save a colony. But you should never get to that point. You should be doing IPM early on in the season, uh, last fall, early on in the spring, during the summer, um, and making sure that it doesn't get to that. The other diseases are pretty straightforward. You know, just uh, know what you know what what's going on with with uh, American and European and chalk root. You know, American and chalk root are certainly stress diseases. Your job is to make sure there's no stress. Make enough food. Enough food. We're going to talk about that more later. But make sure that there's enough food in that colony all the time. Make sure there's no other stresses going on, temperature extremes and ventilation and all of these things. It's all pretty straightforward, but you have to be able to identify the disease and to be able to do something uh, about it, catch it in the bud and, and make sure it doesn't get taken away or get away from you. Wax moss, small high beetle, tracheal mites, all of these things have been with us forever and, and handling them is pretty good, but you got to handle them. You have to take care of wax moth, make sure that, that you don't have uh, too much space in your colony that your bees can't control. Small hive beetle, way, way more of a problem in the south than it is up in the north and way more of a problem in sandy soil than you have. We have a real hard packed clay up here in northeast Ohio and small hive beetles don't ever really take off, but we've got them and we have to make sure, we, we've got traps in to make sure, but you got to be monitoring them and watching, making sure that um, the populations don't get out of control. Tracheal mites aren't nearly the problem they used to, <coughs> excuse me, but that doesn't mean that they're not a problem and you got to be monitoring for them, watch them. Uh, control is pretty simple, the grease patties, if we go back a few years, if you think you need to, best choice uh, is to deal with bees that are resistant to tracheal mites and they're around, the Russians are great with them, uh, so you can look at that. Mice, skunks, and bear, just physical limitations, you know, you got fences and, and mouse guards and whatever, but you got to have fences and mouse guards and whatever, and you can't hope that they don't come and visit, because if they're around, they're going to be there and you're going to have a problem. So, pest management, number three. Number four, control swarming. Um, and I say control swarming, and it may be, control swarming may be let them swarm, because you want to, you want to, um, um, reinfest the, the, the feral environment around your area with bees that are going to set up a colony and, and provide uh, drones for some of your queens and that may that that's a management style. Most of us, however, would like to preserve our bees and, and, and be, be able to have those bees you know uh, work for themselves and thrive and, and help us you know increase our apiaries and whatever. So you're doing all of the things that you need to do to deal with the swarm impulse. You're making a splits last summer so you don't have huge, huge colonies overwintering with old queens. So you've got, you're making a big colony split, a big, uh, splitting a big colony last summer so that come spring you've got two new queens going into and you've got, you've got the best two colonies that you could get. Anticipate pollination or population growth. One's, one is a spurt. Well, part of the part of that will be knowing how many uh, eggs a day your queen is laying, and and being able to follow that and just watching the population. When is the flow? And 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 uh, uh, they're going to be building on the flow if you let them, unless you are managing your population a little bit different. So you want to have most of the bees when your main honey flow starts. Providing room in advance is certainly. Uh, uh, common sense, but uh, when you're looking at when you're looking at a frame full of sealed brood, if you take a look at uh, if you take a careful look at a, a, a frame full of sealed brood with bees on it, you'll see, you'll notice that uh, one bee covers two cells of sealed brood, so that you, when that sealed brood 
emerges, there's going to be, uh, if you had that picture we had earlier of a whole, uh, essentially a whole frame of sealed brood, the bees in there are going to cover two frames. And if that sealed brood is on two, both sides, you're going to have four frames of bees that have to go someplace. And, and knowing that that's going to happen in however many days, you better have those four frames ready and probably some more because you've got more frames. So providing room in advance is easy to do, but you have to go in and you have to be looking. Seek low to no swarming stock. Um, maybe that's part of your goal when you're producing local bees is bees that don't swarm. Um, I, I never had any luck doing that. But I know that it exists and people can do it. Bees that will never swarm. You can also select for bees that swarm 10 times a year. Uh, probably wouldn't recommend that. But uh, if you've got some choice, you've got a big enough population and you're doing, some, you're doing some selection, watching those bees that don't swarm, don't set up swarm cells in the spring uh, is something to select for. Appropriate populations before honey flows, like I said, build uh, before the honey flow, not on the honey flow, so that when you've got the most bees, you've got the most honey coming in, and you've got the most honey being eaten. Um, if, you're, if honey is your goal, then what you want to do is have that population ready before the honey flow starts, so that when you've got a colony chock full of bees, uh, you've got a lot of foragers, and, and you don't have nearly as much brood, so you've got even more foragers available to, available to uh, go out uh, and collect. So you've got, more space, you've got more space to store, you've got more bees to collect, and, and uh, you'll just make a bigger crop. So number four, control swarming. Number five, provide a safe environment. Uh, uh, and this, this, I'll go back to my animal husbandry comment. This, this is for every animal that you can, your cats, your dogs, your chickens. Be safe by keeping your equipment in perfect condition. And, and I'll give you an example on my chicken coop. When the window doesn't close and the raccoon gets in, I haven't provided, I haven't, you know, my equipment wasn't in perfect condition. So uh, that happened real early on a few years ago, and we fixed it, and now it doesn't happen anymore. But your, your bee boxes, when you go to pick up a box and the bottom board splits, and you've just got a mess on your hands, uh, the top cover, the, the uh, outer cover, uh, one, of the, one of the sides falls off, and it's leaking. And, you know, just, just it, it's, it makes your life simpler when things work the way they're supposed to work and keeping them in good shape is what, you're, what you should be doing. Be safe inside the hive by keeping only new clean wax. And I'll say it again. It's, it is, people are telling me, and my observation is it's the easiest thing we can do to help your bees be healthy. And maybe it's expensive. No, it is expensive. But it is, it is definitely becoming more and more critically important that you keep good wax in your hive. Two years and it's gone. Uh, how I regulate mine, mostly what I try to do is it's, it's two years in a, our frame is going to be two years in a honey super and then two years in a brood chamber. So it's really a four year frame but two years in the, in the brood chamber where most of the bees are and, and most of the toxins that are coming in are accumulating in the wax. So two years in the brood chamber and gone. Be safe outside by being as isolated as possible from other bees. Uh, I, how well do you know the guy down the road? Is he doing what he's supposed to be doing? Is he taking care of the problems he's supposed to be taking care of? Are your bees robbing him out and bringing home stuff that you don't want them to? Are his bees so full of mites they're absconding and, and uh, uh, invading your hives and suddenly your mite count goes sky high? And you know that because you've been monitoring. Uh, so if you've got any choices on, on isolation, it's a good choice. It's a good good thing to be able to do. So a lot of times we don't, and and then you need to be your bee, your brother's beekeeper because you need to kind of keep an eye on what's going on down the road. If you know that he's not doing things the way that you'd like to see them done, then you have to be even more vigilant on what's going on with your bees. Be safe outside by avoiding agricultural pesticides. Boy, that is just any more uh, as far away as you can get from farms. No, there's just no doubt about it. There's just too much stuff going out there. And I, and I don't know the role that some of these chemicals are playing, um, but I know that bees that are not near agriculture do better than bees that are. Time after time after time, the commercial guys that are moving bees around will tell you this. When I put them in the woods, 
they're healthy. When I move them to pollination, they're not, uh, or not as healthy. And, and, and they have to work harder to keep them healthy. So the, the, what they're doing then is they're, of course, they're providing enough, you know, more food and they're treating for, they're doing all, all the things that they need to do. If you don't have a choice, you don't have a choice. But if, you, if there's some place you can put them um, to avoid as much, much of the agriculture pesticide problems, keep good records. You know, I'm 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 the, probably the last person in the world that should be telling anybody else to keep good records because I don't keep good records. Well, I try to keep good records. I think we all try to keep good records. But I'll tell you, there's some things on the market right now that are making it easier and easier. And and some of the some of the electronic things, Hive Tracks is one of them. And there are others that are out there that are that make it real simple and or at least more simpler than writing it in a book and trying to remember where the book is the next time you go find your bees. So take a look at some of these things. The technology is getting better. It's getting easier. It's getting cheaper. And boy, I tell you, there's nothing better than being able to go back and review what went on in a bee yard all season long at a moment's notice just by the click of a button rather than have to find the book and get it written down. So keeping good records, uh, very important to being a good manager and uh, going to make you a better beekeeper. Always have extra equipment. If you move bees for a living and your truck breaks, what do you do? And that's why I say always have extra equipment. Anything that you do, any 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 piece of equipment that you pick up and touch, whenever you're going out to do bees, if you don't have it, what happens? If it breaks, what happens? If it gets blown away, what happens? And if you say, well, I got another cover in the truck, no problem, and you put another cover on. If you don't have that cover in the truck, what do you do? So it makes sense. You, you can't duplicate everything, but the things that are going to be most likely to break or blow away or, or malfunction are the things that you should have duplicates for. Or you know the guy that does. Like maybe that guy down the road really is a good beekeeper, and he's got extras. And you know that if something goes wrong, you can call him, and he'll say, I'll be right over, or you can go over and get it. So have those things lined up ahead of time. Uh, if you know they're going to be critical to your operation, and if it breaks, you're out of luck, know where you can get another one. So always have extra equipment. Enough room at the right time, number six. Uh, we've kind of gone through all of this, enough room for the bees, brood, nectar, honey, and pollen. Now, now, honey and pollen, you know, how much honey do you need? Well, you want to make enough, you know, and have enough room. If, if there's no room in your colony for bees to store nectar when they're, when they're beginning to uh, dehydrate it into honey, the house bees, the house bees uh, down below when, when a forager comes in are going to just slow right down and be reluctant to take it. They're just, there's no place to go with it. What do you do? And uh, the foragers coming back since this, and, and they can't give it away so they can go out, so they quit foraging. So if there's no room and there's, there's nectar coming in, bingo, you've lost a potential honey crop, or at least some of it. So you've got to be ahead of the curve, and you've got to have that space up there so that when, so that there's always room for those bees to put nectar in. It doesn't last up there very long, and they, they start filling it up with honey, but you've got to have room. You got to have room for bees. We talked about the, the, the population dynamics of brood and, and adult bees on a comb, and, and uh, if you're looking at a lot of a lot of um, uh, sealed brood, one of the things that, to uh, keep in mind when you're looking at a hive, the, uh, as it gets going and is going fairly good in the summer, is the ratio of eggs to seal, to open brood to sealed brood. Now, an egg is an egg three days, and larva six, and Sealed is 12, so you've got a ratio of 1, 2, and 4. Uh, you should have four times as much sealed brood as you do eggs, about. Uh, and of course, the bees don't lay them out for you very nicely. But as, when you're starting to count brood, and you're me making those, brood, those sealed brood measurements to know how many is there and how many, how many eggs a day your queen is laying, you're going to get an idea of, OK, I've got this much sealed. I should have you know, about this much. Uh, uh, open and I should have hardly any eggs. Uh, you get a feel for, if you start looking, you do some counts the hard way a few times, it'll give you, get you going. But you should have some eggs, more, twice as much open brood and, and a lot of sealed brood. Every time you go in your colony until the, the season turns and they start cutting back. But as the colony's building, that's what you should be looking at is one, two, and four bees and brood. 
nectar, of course, we talked about making honey and honey storage and pollen. Uh, you got to have room around. You got to have room in the brood nest area for some honey and some pollen. And and sometimes, you know, I'm uh, I'm seeing it. I'm not going to say more and more, but I'm, I'm noticed that that I'm seeing that bees seem to be collecting a lot of pollen and just choking a frame up and plum full of pollen. And and then sometimes they'll seal it over, uh, not with honey, but with what appears to be. I'm not sure what's going on. Those those frames don't last long in my hives. Uh, they put it there. They don't eat it. It just sits there and doesn't provide any any resources at all for the colony, and it takes up space. So uh, I'm not sure why bees are doing it, but you've probably seen it. And what do you do with it? Do you leave it there? I get rid of it. If it's pollen that that uh, that uh, they're storing for sometime in the future, and you get rid of it, they're going to replace it. They're going to um, go out and get some more. So. Um, Predicting how much room your bees are going to need. If you keep good records and you know that every year you have a heck of a linden flow, uh, and have had for a bunch of years, and it takes up two, you make two supers before the lindens bloom. You better have those two supers ready and get them on just in time, so that you don't miss any of them. It's the same thing with swarming and all of the rest of the honey flows that you have. Good records are going to help you do that, and being able to count how many bees you're going to have and when you're going to need them is going to help you do that. So number six, enough room at the right time. I, next to Varroa, I think this is probably the next, the, the, the most, uh, one of the, certainly one of the most important rules is enough good food. You don't let your cats starve. You don't let your chickens starve. You make sure that they've got food. They make some on their own. But when there isn't any to be out there, um, you're the beekeeper. These are your responsibility, and you're the one that's making sure that there's enough good food all of the time for every bee in the bunch is how I look at it. The quality and the quantity and the timing of it need to be at the bee's needs, not when you have time. Uh, the, if you just don't get out there for three days because you're on the road or you're traveling or family or whatever, and your bees are out of food or almost out of food, Bees don't ration themselves. Uh, they don't in the, in the in the winter when food is running low, uh, or whenever there's a dearth. There isn't somebody in charge that's saying, you know, slow down, eat a little bit less because because I know food's coming, but uh, we've only got enough for three days here, and and the way you guys are eating, it's not gonna, we're going to run out by noon tomorrow. There isn't anybody saying that. Everybody. Every bee in the colony eats as much as they need when they need it, and bang, they all run out at the same time, and a colony can starve. And if you've watched this, you can watch this in a package. If you've got a feeder can that gets plugged or is empty, and the colony will go and they'll just they'll drain that can, and then boom, the whole package will, or almost the whole package will perish. They all starve to death at about the same time. So enough good food. All of the time for every bee in the bunch. I guarantee you, it is it will be the cheapest insurance and the best medicine you can ever find for a colony that's stressed. Enough good food for bees of Nozema, with chalk brood, with European, any of the stress diseases. Food is going to help, especially Nozema. Nozema's the new Nozema has been a been kind of a, a a quirky animal, and I don't think people have got it quite figured out yet. It seems to be working more like Nozema apis the longer that we've had it, and it's being a problem in the, fall, in the winter and the spring rather than in the summer like it was initially. But I can't swear to that. But I can swear to the fact that a sick bee goes off feed, and if you can't, if, you, if, if she's not going to eat, she's not going to get any better. So if you've noticed that bees are being lethargic and they're not eating and they're not doing what they, you think they should be doing when they should be doing it, get some food in there. And if you have to put some feeding stimulant in, there's a lot of them on the market. They all seem to me to be working about the about the same. And 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 what they do is they make a sick bee hungry and want to eat. And a sick bee that eats is going to at least not get worse. They may not get better, but they're not going to get worse. So get some food into them. And what about growing your own? You know, I've I've, I've been I've I've been thinking. I've been thinking a lot about this for a long time, and 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 leasing 20 acres and putting 20 acres of something in there that 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 my bees can use and that I can harvest and and maybe sell to a farmer a hay crop or alfalfa crop or clover or something. 
I'm thinking more and more. It, it, I want to keep my bees at home. I don't want them out in the corn. I don't want them out in the soybeans. I don't want them out getting sprayed. Uh, what I want them is making honey. And if I put 20 acres of something out there, it's, there's a cost. You got to have the equipment. You got to have the, the skills to, uh, uh, to run the farming equipment to do it, or maybe you hire it done. There is a cost, but but if you start slow, 20 acres may be more, but if you start slow with, with uh, five acres of buckwheat, just to see how it works and, and what can you predict from this and how much effort's involved and what's the cost going to be. I'm, I'm guaranteeing you that, that if, if more beekeepers were doing this, we'd be having fewer problems. We're keeping our bees where we, we know where they are rather than out there hoping they're not in that mess out there in that farmer's field. So growing your own is definitely a possibility, something to consider. Not 20 acres, maybe just one. One acre of, of, of uh, uh, yellow sweet clover and, and white Dutch clover or Elsite clover so you've got bloom the first year and bloom the second year, and, and, and you'll watch your bees feed on that, and you'll see that it works. And you say, yeah, okay, one acre I can do. I can do maybe two or three more and see how it goes and build from there. But um, growing our own is something I think, we need to, I think we need to think a lot more about. So enough good food all of the time for every bee in the bunch. Having only healthy hives. I've talked before about avoiding stress, and what are what are the what are the things that stress colonies? Of course, bad weather when they can't get out and forage. Well, if they can't get out and forage, they're living off of stored food, or you're feeding them, and you're there. I'll go back to the smartphone that you've got, or the Weather Channel, or whatever it is. You're looking at four days of rain, and you've got a lot of you've got a lot of uh, open brood in your colony. What's the best thing you can do? You make sure they don't run out of food that they are living in a luxury of available resources. And that's your job. You throw a pollen patty on them, you, maybe a feeder, but you get some food out there for them so that they don't have one minute of, I need more food. Enough good food all of the time. Don't nurse failing colonies. Um, I, I'm going to bet that everybody listening here is at some time or other, uh, put a whole bunch of effort into a colony that just was never going to, it was the queen's problem, it had a disease problem, it, something was going on, and it just never took off. And no matter what you did for it, how, many, how much resources, how much time, how much effort you put into it, it just never took off. And it was because you didn't have the heart to pinch the queen or you didn't have the, the resources to, to get new comb or whatever it was. Um, uh, the efficiency of your time there goes down to just about zero. You spend a lot of time and money and effort, and the colony just probably doesn't even make it through winter, let alone thrive and make a crop for you. So don't waste time on dinks. Make a, make a decision on a colony that isn't going to go anywhere. You either, if it's, if it's healthy, but it's, it's, um, it's not, it's not uh, uh, thriving, it's probably the queen or maybe there's something else going on in the environment. Join it to another colony. Join the resources of two smaller colonies. You know, one colony, one larger colony is always more efficient than two small ones. So try and take advantage of that. Just don't waste time on dinks. Uh, however, if you've got a small colony that's got, some, got a disease problem or got, a, got an issue with something that you don't want to share with another colony, then, then you have to make a decision, what do I want to do with this colony? And it's probably put it, put it out of its misery because sharing it is only going to spread the problem and it's never going to take off by itself and, and you don't have the time or the resources to nurse it back to health or it can't be nursed back to health uh, because of what's going on. So. Uh, the other one is take your losses in the fall, and, and I'm telling you, that's when I look at commercial beekeepers and, and I'll say, what's your winter loss, and it'll go 8 or 9%, and I can just say, how many did you combine last fall, and he can give me a number because he took his losses in the fall, but he's not losing 30% in the winter. He's got good, healthy, strong colonies going into winter because he spent a lot of time in the fall joining those little ones, those iffy ones, the ones that eh, I might make it, I probably, I could, you know, maybe let's hope. Well, hope is one thing, but success is something entirely different. So they take their losses in the fall. They may go down 20% from their numbers, but the 20, you know, the, the colonies that go into the winter 
you know, I'm not going to say are guaranteed to make it, but are certainly have a lot better chance of making it because of appropriate numbers and appropriate health. And, and, and the bees are doing what they should be doing in the fall in terms of getting ready for winter. So take your losses in the fall. It's the safest and it's the best way. And come spring, you're going to be glad that you did. Be proactive with food, queens, medications, and room. All the things that we said before. Make sure that there's enough good food all of the time for every bee in the bunch. And that there will be all winter long uh, or all summer long, however it is when you put them together. Got good queens laying. If you've got a queen that isn't producing, not enough brood, uh, not enough eggs every day. She's just not measuring up. Uh, your colony is going to suffer if you don't make a decision to replace her. Medications. If you're using medications and you know that you've got a problem and medication is going to solve it, uh, antibiotics or whatever, then do it at the right time. Stop it, whatever that problem is, early in this, rather than <coughs> excuse me, rather than. I hope that it goes away and you don't have to do anything because once before, a long time ago, it did. Uh, be proactive and get in there and get things. I'm not saying treat things pro prophylact prophylactically because you shouldn't be taking antibiotics if you're not sick. But um, once you spot a problem, then you should be acting fast and enough room. And we've talked about that. But be proactive with enough room. You, get, you know a honey flow's coming. You're going to be out of town. Well, you stretch it a little bit and you make sure that there's empty boxes on and that the bees don't get cramped, don't suffer because you weren't prepared. So uh, number eight, only healthy hives. <coughs> number nine, winter well. Uh, right at the top of that list is, is uh, uh, something I like to talk about is take care of the bees that take care of the bees that go into winter. And and if you think of if you think of it like this, your grandparents, if your grandparents aren't healthy, for whatever reason, your parents they're not going to be able to take good care of your parents. And if your parents aren't taken well care of when, when as they're developing, they're not going to develop to their fullest potential, and they're not going to be able to take care of you. And you're the one who suffers because your grandparents weren't taken care of. So if you go back and take a look at that. Where I am in northeast Ohio, this is late August, early September. We start worrying about the grandparents, and we make sure that everything in that colony is well, that the grandparents are healthy, that we've got row under control, that, that there's enough food, that there's enough room. Everything is going right in September as they're beginning to slow down for winter. That way, when, when the queen is producing the parents then, the grandparents are, are at 110% and they're able to do everything necessary for the next generation. You too are part of that uh, uh, caring task force taking care of the next generation in that you are in there with making sure there's enough good stuff and, and, and there, all of the bad stuff has been removed, whatever those things are, so that when the, the bees that go into winter uh, are healthy and wealthy and ready to go, they, you want fat bees going into winter. Uh, if you've ever taken a look at a fat body on a bee, you can you can take a look at winter bees, and when you, it's hard on the bee, but when you pull away the underside of the abdomen and you peel that back, it should be glistening white fat, not not dark uh, uh, just hemolymph. And every bee that you pull out of there should be should be a fat bee. And if you're not don't have fat bees, you should have fat bees now. No matter where you are, you should have some fat bees. You should be looking. So. Uh, uh, the other thing that you need to be doing for winter is making sure that as winter progresses and the bees are moving in the colony, there's enough food in there and it's stored in the right place so that they can get to both carbohydrates, honey and proteins, pollen, or stored food. Now there's two kinds of stored food. There's the fat body that I just mentioned and, and bees will build up on that on the patties that you feed them. They will they will eat that eat those patties and they convert that the the protein in those patties to stored protein in their bodies which they'll use in the winter and they will break down and 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 feed to the young next spring. The other kind of uh, uh, protein that you can feed is the dry stuff, not mixed into a patty but just dry and you can put that outside. And I'm I'm hoping I'm going to get home tonight and we're going to feed some of this 
tonight to mine is we're taking some of the dried protein uh, supplement. We put it in a pail so that if it rains, it doesn't, and bees will find it by tomorrow. We lay a pail on its side, put in some in the back, and make sure that it, it doesn't get rained on. And, and bees will find it uh, before breakfast, before I have breakfast tomorrow morning, and they just dive bomb in there, poof, little explosion of powder, and they get covered with it, and they take it home, and that they will store. They'll put the dry stuff, and so you've got stored protein, and you've got uh, uh, bee stored protein. You've got enough protein in that colony to make sure that the bees, the nurse bees have enough protein to take care of all of the young that your queen can produce next spring. You got to have enough of that. So, uh, big population now, superior population. If you've got Russians, you're going to be have almost nothing. And if you've got Italians, you're going to have a lot. So it depends on the race of bee you've got. Protection. I wrap my hives every year. Uh, it seems to help, and it makes me feel better. So maybe that's maybe that's most of it, but. Uh, it does seem to help, and I use I use um, I use two kinds of wrap. I use the plastic with the thin insulation on one side that I wrap around the colony, and then I take one of the big uh, cardboard boxes that's um, um, uh, wax and, and weatherproof, and I put that over the colony, over that insulation, and it seems to do pretty well for me. But the other thing that I do is I provide insul uh, I provide way more than adequate ventilation, and you can see the board that's there. Warm air rises up through the colony, and and the draft that I produce is because I have screen bottom boards, and the I, I pull it out so that the back third of the floor is exposed, and I just get a, almost a breeze going right up the back of my colony, and uh, it will, as it goes up, it rises, it takes the warm air with it, it goes up through the inner cover hole, and then it hits, and then it hits that that board on top of it, and that board is just simply two inch two inch insulation with a groove. Uh, chiseled out of it, that uh, the warm air rises up, goes through the hole in the inner cover, hits that groove, and is funneled out through the front entrance of the of the inner cover outside. I don't have a ventilation problem, and this keeps the air moving in the colony. The bees are in the front two thirds of the colony, and they're doing just fine. They're they're high and they're dry, and they've got enough food, and they're they're spending winter the way that they should. You can take a look. One of the things that I saw at the WAS meeting that I was at this last weekend was uh, thermal cam uh, uh, infrared cameras that you can measure, you can see warm spots in. And this is a good picture of a colony that's doing well. You can see right where the warmest spot is in the, in the cluster. The camera that I was looking at at was you could look at a whole, you could stand uh, 30 yards away and look at a whole bee yard and you could see which ones were warm and which ones weren't and which ones were probably going to need some help. Uh, I can see that this is going to be a, tr a tool that beekeepers are going to become to rely on. Uh, I like I like being able to do that. I don't have one, but I have friends who have one, and and uh, hopefully will be uh, um, able to use it more. Enough food. You see that picture up on the left up there. Uh, what they're doing is weighing that colony, and and uh, they're using a spring scale. I've got one of those. And the way that I make it work is I weigh the front and I weigh the back and I add the two and that tells me the weight of the colony. And my colonies here in Ohio need to weigh over 150 pounds when I put them to bed in, in the in the fall. I like that, that. That's just about 100 pounds of honey and 50 pounds of bees and wax and boxes and whatever. Um, but I, over 100, uh, I like to have about close to 100 pounds of honey. That's overkill until last winter. Been here 30 years. Last winter is the worst winter we've had, and 100 pounds of honey did not last. So I learned to winter in Wisconsin, and 100 pounds of honey, 100 to 120 pounds of honey worked there. Last winter, 100 pounds. So guess what? How much honey my bees are going to have this year? They're going to have more than 100 pounds. So enough good food in the right place, uh, good population, good good ventilation and protection, a windbreak, absolutely a windbreak. Uh, some kind of something up there bales of straw or or landscape burlap or something, and and uh, make sure uh, you don't leave your chickens out in the in the winter. They go outside, but they go in at night. You don't leave your dogs out all the time. Um, your bee shouldn't be out. Your bee should have adequate protection. Food safety. Uh, common sense stuff here, but uh, it's a food, and you are feeding it to your family. So what do you want to do? You want to prevent harvest contamination, keep it covered as you're bringing it back to the to your honey house. When you've got uh, a good, wonderful honey crop, don't don't overheat it and wreck it. 
make sure the moisture content is right, and store in clean containers. All of this is just, just fundamental common sense, but sometimes we have to remind ourselves when it, when it looks like we're going to take some time and cut some corners and things. And This is food. You're feeding it to your family and yourself, and, and uh, uh, just make sure that you're doing what you're doing and, it's, and that it's gonna, not going to hurt your crop. I think um, there's some more rules, and, and these have kind of evolved, and then at the beginning I said I didn't say the 10 rules of modern beekeeping, just 10 of them, and I've of course come up with some modern beekeeper rules, I think, and, and these have to do not with the bees, although they're in, the bees are going to be influenced by what you're doing here, but as a beekeeper, are you, uh, are you, uh, do you have continuing education? Are you taking, oh, there, I took the beginner's class, and, and uh, maybe I should take it again just to see if there's something new coming along that I haven't been, or an advanced class. What about advanced skills? Have you learned queen rearing, or have you worked with a commercial beekeeper and saw how they do things in, in their operation? Uh, do you belong to an association? And if you don't, I strongly suggest that you do. Uh, if you do belong to an association, have you ever raised a hand to be an officer and, and take some leadership role and, and try and steer the organization forward rather than sideways or sometimes backwards like they tend to go sometimes? Uh, and, and new blood is always good. A president shouldn't be president more than a couple, three years because you need to get more, you get, need to get new people in there, a new vision, and the president needs a rest. So if you've got one of those groups where, uh, and our group was was uh, that way, I was president too long and, and um, finally got out of the role and, and, and the, the change has been fantastic. So uh, you're getting, you kind of get in a rut. So if you've been a president, if you've been an officer more than a couple years, uh, see if you can get somebody in there. Teach a class. You know, that beginner's class. If you've been doing this long enough, it's time for you to teach the class. Be a mentor. Help somebody. Have them come over and watch you or go over and watch them and point out the things that they can be doing better. Beekeeper health. Uh, stings, reactions, and giving an injection. Um, kind of some controversy on giving somebody a shot, but uh, do you know how to do it? If you're in a bee yard and you're 20 miles from nowhere and suddenly you have that that reaction, do you have a stink hit and, and do you know how to give yourself a reaction or an injection and save your life? Uh, good ergonomics on lifting heavy boxes. Use your legs and your, you know, not your back. Every beekeeper supposedly has a bad back except the smart ones who know how to lift a heavy box. Uh, do you know how to stop robbing? If you get a robbing incident going in your in your bee yard, do you know how to stop it? And what do you do? And you know, do you close everything up and and make sure that nobody can get inside anywhere, nobody can get out? But that's important to know. Do you know the symptoms of heat exhaustion or heat stroke? Do you know what happens because when you get heat stroke, your your brain just goes fuzzy and and you really don't know what you're doing and and suddenly you're laying on the ground not knowing what happened and it, it can be fatal. So know the cold sweats and the things that are going on if you if you've had too much uh, been out in the sun too long. Does your spouse know where every one of your bee yards are? Uh, you go out and you say, "Yeah, I'm going over. To, I'm going over to the Johnson Yard. I'll be back for supper." And you're not back for supper. Where the heck is the Johnson Yard? How do I get there? She calls your cell phone. You don't answer. How do I get there? I'm not even sure where it is. So uh, you should probably have a map and have somebody know where you are. Could you control a life-threatening situation in five minutes? You've got a colony that's just gone berserk, and, 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 and your family's getting stung, and neighbors are getting stung, and the animals are getting stung, and the bees are just going crazy, and, and you've got to do something right now to stop this. Can you kill a colony to save lives? And, 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 and this is something you never want to have to think about or never have to do, but you, in the back of your mind, yep, I know how to do that. I know two ways to do it. And one of them is the way that the Florida people do it. They've got, a, they've got black garbage bags that are as big as my colony, and they just simply put it over the top of that colony, and they tie it shut on the bottom, and the sun cooks that colony in about 15 minutes. Meanwhile, they're not escaping. The other way is to uh, be able to get uh, two five-gallon pails of cold water uh, with, soap, with lots and lots and lots and lots of soap in them. And, and make two, 10 gallons of soapy water, take the top off, and dump the 10 gallons, plug the door, dump the 10 gallons in, put the top back on, and that usually pretty much settles it down. So if you know it in the back of your mind, yeah, I can do this. If you got that plastic, I got that plastic bag in my, in my pail of smoker fuel, and, and I've got, 
a, a, a container of just soap in my pail of smoker fuel. So they're always handy. And and I hope that I never have to use them. So there's some beekeeper rules that you can think about, and and uh, uh, maybe maybe uh, change some of the things that you do, or stop start doing some things that you haven't been doing. So there you have ten rules of modern beekeeping plus the last one: do no harm. And we've talked about all of the things that we can do, and boy, I tell you, it comes right down to the poison we put in a beehive. And, and everything you do should be aimed at not having to put poison in a beehive. Everything you do, no poison in a beehive, no, no miticides, no pesticides, no, none of that should be, ever be in a bee yard or in a beehive. And that's what you need to be thinking about all the time. What do I have to do today so I don't have to do that next week or next month? Do no harm. So. Maybe there should be 10 plus rules for modern beekeeping with those beekeeper rules uh, added at the end, but um, I hope this helps. Good, good basic uh, animal husbandry concepts here that we've just applied to beekeeping. So Shane, I think that's all that I've got. I think that, uh, I think that that was quite a bit. Um, certainly, I'm sure we could sit here and add a 11, 12, 13, and so on. Um, but that was really quite a, an impressive list. There are, as you might expect, several questions. Um, I've tried to, to answer some of them as you were going through, but um, there's, there's a lot of questions, Kim, about um, the, the cleanliness of the wax, and, and you mentioned that on several of the slides uh, and harped on it and, and emphasized its importance, which I truly think it is. How, how do you go about introducing uh, new wax, or I, I guess you could ask that same question, how do you get rid of the old wax at the same time not impacting sort of the growth of that colony or, or the strength of the colony? Well, uh, changing wax as often as I do, it does. It, it, they spend time making wax where normally you'd think they should be making, um, you know, raising young or, or making honey. So it does, it does take resources out of, out of, out of production and makes it turning it into wax, but how I handle it is, is, is uh, comb that's only a couple years old comes off plastic foundation with a putty knife pretty easily. And, and it's one of those tasks that I don't like doing, but I, I, I you know, one putty knife, I use all eight frame medium copies, so I got a putty knife that's a medium colony, or medium frame wide, and, and bingo one side, flip it over, and you know, you have to chop at it a little bit, the other side comes off. And and then I scrape it, try to get it a little bit cleaner. I get it as clean as I can, and usually there's still enough wax left that the bees will take to it. I'm leaving some in there, but I'm getting rid of you know 99% of it. If I'm using new plastic foundation, which I which I tend to do a lot, I I save my cappings wax, which is going to be the least or none uh, affected by the stuff that's in the wax. And I will take unwaxed plastic foundation and using a sponge brush that you can get at a paint store coat my plastic foundation with that. And I'll tell you, I've had such good luck with that. I, you, I put that in, and I can put it in side by side with wax foundation. I did this several years ago just to see, and the bees take to it just fine. So I haven't had any trouble with plastic foundation if you apply enough clean wax to it before you give it to the bees. Great. Um, there's there's several questions sort of uh, about weak colonies, and your there's the word dink is a, is a new <laughs> word to many people here. So uh, sort of surrounding that topic, can you sort of explain to us what you mean by dink and how you assess a colony, determine its dinkness, um, <laughs> and, and or whether it should be unioned uh, with other colonies? Well, uh, uh, I, I, probably the, the simplest way to imagine a dink colony is if you get five packages of bees and four of them are in two deeps and two honey supers and one of them is still in the first deep, that's a dink. Uh, I mean, that's, that's kind of an extreme example, but that's how I look at it. Is, is, is I'm, when I'm comparing a colony that's not, that's not very big to other colonies that are big, why are the other ones big and this one's not? Or why isn't this one as big as the other ones? And if I can see no reason, uh, they started out the same, the big ones grew, this one didn't, something's going on with a queen, uh, 
if I've if I've examined the colony, I find no no sample no example of disease. The mite level is where it should be. Uh, it's just the queen isn't performing. She isn't producing enough. Or the genetics of the colony is such that even if she's got you know, even if she's producing kind of enough bees, they're just not doing anything. And I've seen colonies where bees just kind of don't do anything, or they don't do enough, or they don't do it long enough for the day, or whatever. But it's when you compare it, okay, I got four packages, and three of them are in two deeps, and one of them is still in, you know, hasn't drawn out the first deep. That's a dink. Now, when you get a colony that, that, um, um, you don't have anything to compare it to, and you, it's, it's like, you, you know, when you've got one tomato plant, and, and it's and it's growing. Uh, how's it doing? Well, I got two tomatoes out of it. Well, the guy down the road has gotten a bushel of tomatoes out of his tomato plant that he got at the same size at the same time. So if you've got nothing to compare it to, then you have to fall back on good records. And if you've got good records, you know that colonies, your colonies should be the 1st of June, should be about this big, should have about this population, should be collecting lots and lots of whatever the the nectar flow is at the time if it's not then you've got then you've got some historical data to compare it to and are you going to sit here and let this colony eat food and eat food and eat food and not produce anything or are you going to take it if it's healthy and combine the resources get rid of the genetics that is the queen and combine the resources with another colony and and um, kind of not 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 put any more energy or time or resources into a colony that's not doing well. That answer your question? Kind of? <laughs> I think so. <laughs> um, I, we're, we've we've hit the seven o'clock hour, but I do have uh, just one more question. It's along the same lines, and and you mentioned that a lot of the commercial guys you speak with take their losses in the fall. So can you give us some guidelines, and I know it's going to vary based on location and, and climate and things like that across the country, but some guidelines as to when it's too late to take uh, to combined colonies to take those losses. Oh, good question. Uh, and you're right, it, it's, uh, everything is local, but what I want, when I'm, when I'm combining colonies in the fall, what I want is I want a colony, every colony that's only half as big as most of my colonies is 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 uh, uh, up up for grabs. If they, they just haven't, and I've got two of them right now that are only about half as big as everybody else. They just haven't made the honey. They haven't, and they're gonna they're gonna be combined. They're healthy. They don't have any disease. But how late can I do this? Well, it's what the end of September, and and I'm gonna take the resources out of those colonies, and I'm gonna share them with all the rest of the colonies. The honey is going to go, whatever little honey there is, is going to go in the colonies that are lightest. So end of September in northeast Ohio, uh, I'll shake the bees into probably a couple of the, of the uh, other colonies, and that colony will no longer exist. There will be a blank spot in a row for, and nobody, for anybody to go home to. So the resources get spread out. I know who's got how much honey and a little bit more will help. I know who's got how much pollen, a little more would help if there's any to share. And and the bees are gonna the bees are probably not gonna do well anyway because the colony hasn't been doing very much. They probably aren't a lot of fat bees. You got a lot of summer bees less, and they're just they're they're short timers anyway. So how late? Um, end of September probably. You want to be able to you want to be able to get in there because it's gonna take you a while to do this. This isn't a ten minute job because you're opening up three or four colonies, four or five depending. And and the, the the commercial guys are doing it now. Uh, I talked to I talked to a couple of queen producers who have honey colonies out in Montana, and they're taking them back to California, and they're doing it right now. Or they did it the last couple of weeks so they can get the truck loaded. They don't want to take back colonies that aren't any good. Why bother? So they've got it done already. So you're looking at September. Great. Um. I appreciate your, your time, Kim. It's always a pleasure. Your wealth of knowledge, and we certainly do uh, appreciate you sharing that with us. Um, so thank you very much. I do want to just mention, because there are a couple people that have asked this, that this, uh, this webinar has been recorded and give us a, probably until early next week and we'll pop it up to the Brushy Mountain YouTube channel so you can watch it at your leisure. And I'll also mention that there's several other webinars up there that Kim has done over the past and some other guests that we've had and some others that uh, the bee farm have done. So you can check those out as well. So Kim, 
once again, thanks. I know you've been on the road traveling a lot, and you just got back this week, and here you are doing this, this talk for us. Again, we really do appreciate it. And for those of you, uh, I'll give Kim a, uh, the shameless plug that he probably won't give himself. You can see on the, uh, the slide here that the Bee Culture magazine, he mentioned uh, things for beekeepers. I would encourage people to get a subscription to this magazine. It's a fantastic magazine, well worth the money. I'll also mention that he's got some fantastic books, uh, books that we deem uh, worthy of including in our beginner's kit. So they uh, sort of surpass the others that we think uh, might be good for those kits. So check those out as well. Uh, again, Kim, thanks so much. Really appreciate it um, and look forward to the next time. All right, Shane, thank you. Thank you, everybody. I hope it was worth your time, and uh, have a good fall and winter. Thanks a lot. You all have a good evening. Bye-bye.